You know, sometimes you meet people that right off the bat, they just stand out uh, in your mind. And it, it may be because of an outstanding achievement or an outstanding talent or giftedness or an uh, outstanding personality, but they're just extraordinary, they're unusual uh, people. We call these people remarkable people. You, you could think of them very easily. You go, that person's remarkable. She's remarkable, he's remarkable, things like that. Now, all of us wanna live remarkable lives and God wants you to live a remarkable life. That doesn't mean famous. Fame has nothing to do with it. You can make an impact and most of the world not even know who you are, but you have an enormous impact uh, on the world through your legacy. And you'll never, by the way, know your legacy on this earth. You'll never know it because you don't know all the people whose lives have been changed by people you touched and they touched others and on and on and on. But we wanna live remarkable lives and as parents, those of you who are parents, we all want remarkable kids and we want remarkable grandkids and we want them to have an impact in lives. How many of you um, either own a small business or you work for a business uh, that offers either a, a product or a, a service of some kind? Can I see your hands? Okay, yeah, that's a lot of you. Um, would you say it's easier to get people's attention or harder to get people's attention today? It's harder, isn't it? Because there's so much competition out there uh, with all of the noise and all of the news and all of the media and all social media, things like that. How does your product, how does your business, how does your, your uh, service get attention? Well, the only thing that really gets attention is that which is remarkable. For instance, it, it, you, know, you can have two restaurants right next to each other and one of them, nobody's going to at all, and the other one, there's a line of people waiting to get in, and they're willing to wait up to an hour to, to have a meal. Why? Remarkable food. Or a, a company creates a remarkable product, and it just goes like gangbusters, and it skyrockets. And Why is it that some hotels and motels have people booking up a long time in advance and others are empty and lots of vacancies, remarkable service. Now, I've written, written on your outline uh, a definition of remarkable. Remarkable means exceptional, it means outstanding, it means uncommon, it means worthy of attention. History, human history is written primarily by remarkable people. And you could easily make a list of people you would think in different areas, in arts and entertainment and in government and in law and all the different areas, yeah, well, they were remarkable and they made, it, made a pretty big uh, impact. But I will say this to you. God wants you to have a remarkable life, but the only way you'll ever be able to live it is if you're willing to be different. If you wanna be like everybody else, you're never gonna be remarkable. That's the very definition of remarkable is it's not common. You are uncommon. To be remarkable in life means you're not like other people. And if you want children who are remarkable children, you have to teach them how to not care about being like everybody else. That's not remarkable, that's just common. So the secret of remarkable people is that they're willing to do things that the rest of us aren't willing to do. They're willing to develop habits that are uncommon. They're willing to put in extra hours that are uncommon. They're willing to make effort that the rest of the world isn't willing to make. They're willing to pay a price in order to make a remarkable difference that most people aren't willing uh, uh, to make and, and to learn. Uh, this last week, it was interesting, I, I read a fascinating study. It was in two different magazines and I actually read it in two different magazines, in, in Harvard Business Review and also in Forbes magazine of a study of a thousand managers who felt, quote, stuck in their career. They, they did this study, people thought, I've I'm, I'm, I'm been at the level I've at, I've been at the level I'm at right now for a long time and I don't think I'm ever gonna make any more progress in my career. I don't think I'm gonna get any in promotions. I am stuck in a dead end career. 
And so then they went ahead and did a study and they interviewed the bosses, they interviewed the people and they discovered that those people, 97% of them, had either one or more of what they called career limiting habits. Career limiting habits. And, and they made a list of the 10 most common career limiting habits. And even when people knew that they had them, they don't change even though they know it's keeping them from actually growing and developing and, and making a greater impact of their life. Today, we're going to look at how do you build a remarkable life. And we're gonna look at four of the antidotes to these career limiting habits. Now, the Bible is filled with examples of, of remarkable people. Uh, Deborah was a remarkable person. Esther, she was a remarkable person. Uh, uh, Job, Jonah, uh, Nehemiah was a remarkable businessman and, and on and on and on. Some of the people in the Bible, they're famous, some of them you wouldn't know, but they all were pretty remarkable uh, in the way that they lived. One of them that you have heard of if you've been around Saddleback was a guy named Daniel who was taken as a slave from Israel back to Babylon, which over came Israel and took the entire nation as slaves during the Babylonian empire. And the Bible says this, notice on your outline, Daniel chapter six, verse three. Daniel so distinguished himself from all the other leaders by his remarkable qualities, circle that, his remarkable qualities, that the king, this is Nebuchadnezzar, the emperor of the Babylonian empire, planned to put him, Daniel, in charge over the entire empire. Are you kidding me? Wow. A guy who starts off as a slave and is taken hostage to a foreign country and he doesn't want to be there, but he has so many remarkable qualities in his life that the most powerful man in the world, King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonian empire, goes, I'm going to put that guy as number two and he's gonna be in charge of my entire empire. I wanna know what those qualities were. Today, we're gonna to look at four of the qualities that were in Daniel's life. And I want us to look at it from two different points. First, in your own life, these are things you can learn. These are things that you can develop. And the rest of your life can be the best of your life if you're willing to put in the effort. Now, if you're not willing to put in the effort, you can go ahead and leave right now because Knowing about them doesn't change you. Uh, they said in that study of those managers, they knew some of the things they needed to change, they just didn't change them. But if you're willing to put that effort in to make those changes and ask God to give you the strength to make those changes, uh, the rest of your life could be the best of your life. And we're gonna look at the antidotes, four antidotes to four of the big common things that hold people back in life keys to living a remarkable life, but also because we've been in this series on family, I want us to look at it, how do you build them in your children? You want remarkable kids? You want them to succeed in their life? Well, there's certain things that you can build in their life. Now, growing up, you heard in school about the three R's. You remember that, the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Now, what's strange to me is if that's about education, why are two of them misspelled? Because writing and arithmetic don't start with R. So it seems kind of uh, self-defeating. Uh, but I, I've got a panel of moms who are gonna help me with what I call the four R's. Reading is important, writing is important, arithmetic is important. But you can have all those and still not be remarkable. You gotta have the, the remarkable qualities that Daniel had. And we're going to look at those right now with our panel. So I want you to welcome uh, Julia and Jody and Deanna. I'll introduce them to you. Bring them, on, bring them out with an applause. Thank you, ladies. These, uh, these women are not only moms, but all three of them have been teachers. And I thought this would be great to have them talk about how do we teach four R's that are different from the three R's. Uh, Julia Bernier is a mother of two. Uh, she's got a 24-year-old son and a 22-year-old daughter. She's taught elementary school. She's taught junior high. God bless you. Um, 
Here at Saddleback, she's volunteered as a mission leader. She's hosted small groups. She prays with other people out in our, our prayer garden. Uh, welcome, Julia. All right? Thank you. All right. Jody Rosser is the mother of two boys, an 11-year-old and a 15-year-old. Uh, she is a lab teacher for grade school, that's kindergarten through sixth grade, in science, technology, uh, engineering, and math. She, where were you when we all needed tutors in engineering, math, and technology? Okay, she serves as a kid's small group leader here at Saddleback Church. Uh, she's a coach for Treasured Moms, which is one of our women's studies program. So welcome, Jody. we're glad you're here. Thank you. And on the end, Deanna Rudder is the mother of two daughters. And she's got a four-year-old and a six-year-old, some of my favorite stages. She's an elementary school principal with uh, Irvine Unified School District, and she's helped out and served here at Saddleback a long time, volunteers with Irvine uh, Campus Special Events. So welcome, Deanna, we're glad you're here. Thank you. Now let's get right into it, okay? We got a lot to cover, four R's for a remarkable life. I've gotta grow them in my life, and if I want remarkable kids, I've gotta build them into their lives. Here they are, number one. If I want to build a remarkable life and a remarkable career, I must learn to be respectful of everybody. I must learn to be respectful to everyone. This is the starting point. Respect is the foundation of a remarkable life. Respecting others shows reverence for God. It shows humility in the way you relate to other people. You say, well, why, is, why have you got this as the number one quality in a remarkable life? Because today, everybody's rude. You wanna agree with that? Is the, is the world getting more respecting or more disrespectful? Yeah, no, we're getting ruder. The world is becoming more uncivil or incivil. And so the more rude the world gets, the more a person who is respectable of everybody becomes remarkable. You stand out like a bright star uh, on, on a dark night. Now, I've given you a definition there on your outline. Uh, the definition of respect, or to be respectful, it means to appreciate the uniqueness, value the worth, and affirm the dignity of everyone because God made them. I wanna read again, because notice three qualities. Truly to be respectful of everybody means you appreciate their uniqueness, because they're not like you, can you appreciate people who are not like you? Uh, you value their worth and you affirm their dignity. Everyone, because God made them. You see, anytime you disrespect anything God made, it's an insult to God. God says, wait a minute, I made them. I made that person. I made you and I made them. You think I love you more than I love them? You think you're more important than they are? It's actually quite arrogant. It's quite egotistical. It's quite prideful. When we don't respect other people, we're basically saying, God, you goofed up. You made a mistake. And, and you should have made everybody like me, which I'm the standard of perfection here. Well, that doesn't work. We all know you're not standard. I'm not standard. Everybody is broken. Um, it's arrogant. I told you it's the opposite of humility. Anytime I'm rude to you, or anybody is rude to you, or anytime you're rude to anybody else, you're revealing your ego. You think in that moment that you don't need to be respectful. You think well, if the clerk is a jerk, you still need to be respectful. Now, I'm not saying you have to approve of everything. No, no, God doesn't approve of everything I do, doesn't approve of everything you do, or anybody else for that matter. There's a difference between acceptance and approval. He accepts us, he loves us, he values us. He, knows, he says we have dignity even though we're flawed we're sinful, we're broken. They're both true. And, and, and so, God looks to bless people who are respectful. If you want God's blessing on your business, on your career, on your family, on your friendships, on your relationship, whatever you want God to bless, you need to be respectful in every area of your life. It's the foundation. There's so many promised promises that are uh, given in the Bible that say that when you build this quality, respectfulness, that you will be blessed. Let me show you a couple. Here's one, Matthew 23, verse 12. 
If you put yourself above others, so you don't feel like you have to respect them, you'll be put down. If you put yourself above others, you'll be put down. But if you humble yourself, you will be honored by others. Study after study have shown that people, who are, employees who are disrespectful get stuck. They don't keep progressing in their career. They get stuck because people uh, don't want to work with people who are disrespectful. So God leaves no wiggle room about this. Let me show you some, some verses. 1 Peter 2.17. The Bible says, show real respect to people you like. Oh no, that's not what it says. Show, let's read it aloud together. Show real respect to, circle that, to everyone. Now, just in case you don't understand what the word everyone means, which by the way, I looked up that word in the original Greek, and in the original Greek, the word everyone means everyone. <laughs> there's no exception. But just in case, you know, you think there's some wiggle room, God 30, 40, 50 times in scripture tells us specific groups of people that you must, must show respect to if you want God's blessing on your life and on your career. Um, I'm gonna go through 10 of these very fast. And uh, I, I'm, in order to save time, I didn't even write all the verses out. If you would like these verses, I'll be happy to send them to you if you're watching online or listen to this on, on an MP3, whatever, uh, you can actually here just take a card out and, and write the word verses on it, and I'll send all these verses to you this week. They're all written out. But I'm just gonna give you the fill-ins. There's 10 different groups God says you have to show respect to if you want his blessing on your life. Number one, I must show respect for God's name and word. I must show respect for God's name and God's word. I can't be using God's name as a cuss word or as, a, as a, an additive, just like a, uh, uh, you're like, oh God, uh, God, oh God. You know, no, th don't use God as an exclamation point. You, you, you take his word and you take his name uh, seriously. Second, I must show respect to my parents. In the 10 commandments, one of the commandments is honor your father and mother, and it's the only of the 10 commandments that actually has a promise with it. And it says, and if you read these verses that I've written out here, Ephesians 6, 3, 2 and 3, that if you honor your father and mother, you'll have a long life full of blessing. It's the only promise of the Ten Commandments that has a promise with it. Uh, number three, I must show respect to my spouse. If you are uh, married, you're a husband, you're a wife, then you, God expects you to show respect to your, your spouse. And if you don't, by the way, guys, men, did you know that if you don't respect your wife, the Bible says God will not hear your prayers? Uh-oh. <laughs> this is one verse you gotta see. Let me put it on the screen. First Peter, <laughs> First Peter 3, 7, and 8, okay? Here's what it says. You husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat her with understanding as you live together. She may be physically weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. And if you don't treat her as you should, your prayers will not be heard. Bam. I'm sorry, honey. So you need to treat them, or there's, that's out of the New Living Translation. Now, before you women get cocky, I have a verse for you too. <laughs> Ephesians 5.33 says this, and he starts with the guys again. Again, I say, again, okay? Because we don't always learn it that well. The husband must love his wife as a part of himself. It's like, love your neighbors yourself. You're to love your wife as yourself. You know, they're treating her with respect. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband, praising and honoring him from the living Bible. All right, number four, uh, the Bible says that God expects me to respect other church members in, in our church family and pastors. The Bible says we're to treat each other as brothers and sisters. We are to outdo each other in showing respect to each other. I'll be happy to send you these verses, Romans 12, 10, Hebrews 13, 17. Uh, but we're to respect each other in the family of God. Number five, the Bible says that I'm expected to show respect to older people. 
You've heard the phrase, respect your elders. Well, guess where it came from? It's from the Bible. God says that if you want his blessing, you must respect the elderly. In Leviticus 19, 32. Number six, I must show respect, this may surprise you, to unbelievers. Doesn't matter if they're an atheist or an agnostic or some other religion or no religion at all, secularist, whatever. The Bible says, God expects me to show respect to unbelievers, 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, and says when you share your hope with them, always do it with gentleness and respect. Number seven, I am to show specifically respect to the poor. To the poor. The Bible says if you're unkind to the poor, you insult your creator. But if you're kind to them, then you show respect to God and you show respect to them. And so somebody may not have as much money as you do. You don't get any leeway in disrespecting them because they can't afford what you can afford. You have to show respect to the poor. Number eight, I am to show respect to immigrants. Now, this is one that's actually mentioned over and over. It's not mentioned just one time. It's mentioned over and over. I am to show respect to immigrants. In in fact, let me show you this verse too because this is a hot button issue uh, right now particularly in in the United States. Leviticus 19, 33 and 34 says this. You must never mistreat any foreigner who is living in your country. Instead, you must treat them just as you treat your own citizens. I didn't say this. God did. God did. Love foreigners as you love yourselves because you remember that your ancestors were foreigners at one time in a new country. And I am the Lord your God. I don't have time to go into this, but the Bible, very clearly, God gets mad. He gets ticked off when we don't show foreigners or immigrants respect. Uh, number nine, this is, these are getting harder Number nine, I am to show respect to my opponents, to enemies, to the people who attack you or maybe persecute you or maybe try to put you down or you know, plan for your defeat. Uh, it, it's easy to show respect to people you like. It's hard to show respect to people you dislike or people who have a different political persuasion or different religious persuasion. Do you show respect to people who violently disagree with you? That's a mark of a Christian. Here's what Jesus said. These are the words of Christ himself. Matthew 5, 44 to 47. I'm gonna read this one to you too. Jesus said, you've heard it said, love your enemies and hate your, I mean, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I tell you, and he said, no, not love your neighbor and hate your enemies. I tell you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. In this way, you show that you are the children of your heavenly father, your father in heaven. It shows you're a follower of Christ. You're in the family. If you only love those who love you, do you deserve a reward? Obviously, no. Are you doing anything remarkable? Notice there's that word, remarkable. Are you doing anything remarkable if you only welcome your friends? The answer is obviously not. Everybody does that. In God's word translation. So we, we are, you, how do you be a remarkable person? When, when they are attacking you, you give nothing but love back. When they're disrespectful to you, you are respectful to them. He said, that's how you know you really have been saved, that you're in the family of God. And then number 10, this one's hard too sometimes. Uh, I am to show respect to government leaders. Oh, Really? Really, even the opposite party, whatever. Um, The Bible tells us over and over that we are to respect the position even when people are not doing respectful things. Now, that's just a list, and I just gave you 10. If I could have given you 30, 40 very specific uh, groups. But let's go to my panel of moms and teachers here, and let's talk about how do you learn to treat everybody with respect. Uh, How did you learn it? How do you teach kids how to learn it? 
You know, one of the things um, growing up for my sister and I is we grew up in an unbelieving, unchurched mm-hmm. home. And unfortunately, my parents had lots of pain from their childhood, mm-hmm. and they ended up um, drinking alcohol and became alcoholics. Mm-hmm. So it was a very tumultuous upbringing, and it was um, in an unstable environment. And as um, I grew and got older, um, it was more and more difficult to just respect my dad. And he was stubborn, he was difficult, he was rude, and very hurtful. And so when I finally did say yes to Jesus myself, my sister and I had used that time to just share. We shared over 20 years who Christ was and shared his love. But there was a day when I was having such a hard time forgiving him because he hurt me so, so much. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, God changed me and he showed me that my dad had been raised with so much pain in his life that he really um, did not know how to do anything differently. As my sister and I continued to pray for him, he came to Christ. Wow. He softened, his heart was softened, but I had to learn to respect him before he was kind to me. You're never going to win anybody to Christ that you disrespect. Now, you say, well, what they're doing is not respectable. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about their behavior. Uh, If you only respected perfect people, nobody would respect you. Because you're not perfect, and I'm not, and nobody else is. By the way, some of you, you you had parents who were pretty disrespectable in, in their behavior. Or maybe you didn't even know them. Why did God choose your parents for you? Some of you go, well, why didn't God give me a good parents like she has or like he has? Because if God had given you different parents, you wouldn't exist. Now let's listen very clear, carefully. God chose your parents to be your parents, not because they were good at parenting. God chose your parents to be your parents. Not be- Some of you didn't even know them. Maybe you were abandoned by them. But God chose your parents to be your parents because they had just the DNA to create you. And nobody else could create you. And God is far more interested in creating you than he was in their parenting skills. They may have been terrible at parenting, but without your mother's DNA and your dad's DNA, you would not exist. And God was interested in creating you, and he can do it out of all kinds of uh, you know, bad circumstances. So when it says honor your father and mother, it doesn't mean honor the pain they gave you. It doesn't mean honor the harm or the hurt. It means honor the fact that God chose them to create you. You can honor that. Because without them, your mother's DNA and your dad's DNA, you would not exist. And that's what God wants us to honor. What, what, go ahead. Well, I was going to say for us in our family, we want to model respect to our kids. And so um, I think I have a teenager and a soon to be teenager. And so sometimes they don't always talk respectfully to me. And it's easy to want to react in anger back and just whatever I'm feeling just kind of triggers out and I start to explode on them. And I'm realizing that we need to respond in love. It's easy to want to react, but instead we need to slow down and think before, because we're showing them how to um, treat people with respect. And if we can't show them respect, then they're not gonna show anyone else respect. So there's that great verse that says, uh, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So we have to slow down so we can respond in love, not react in anger. That's great. I hope you hear what Jody's saying. When I'm angry with you, it's highly unlikely that I'm being respectful. Because it's hard to be respectful to somebody when you're ticked off. And so you might need to let that cool, cool down first. And, and, and what she just said is, if I want my kids to be respectful, I have to respect them. I have to model it. How do you be respectful even when you're upset with somebody? You can be respectful when you totally disagree with something that somebody's done or a a value or a decision or a choice, Uh, but you can always show respect no matter what. And, and, And we have to model that for our kids. 
when I think about respect and how we do it, and in fairness, I work with little guys and I have little kids, so I think of how important it is to model, but then to also be explicit with what respect looks like mm. and what the picture of that is, because the ki kids hear that word a lot. They hear it in schools, they hear it from us, but sometimes they don't know the specific actions of what that looks like in practice. And so the more clear you can be with them about that, so you know with, with my kids, if we're getting ready to go into a situation and um, you know it's your birthday party and you're gonna have lots of different friends from lots of different groups, what does it look like to respect all of those people um, and having that conversation with them? And you know, I do it with kids, but then I think I also do it with adults on the other end when we talk about professional respect because someone comes into my office to say, mm. I can't deal with this person anymore, I'm done mm. with them. And so then you get to have a great conversation about, so what does professional respect look like? What are the action steps that I can take to show someone what that looks like. How do I deal with my own emotion and then what do I do moving forward? You know, it's not rocket science, this first quality, the foundational quality of just treating everybody with respect, or treating everybody with dignity, even people you disagree with and even people who are not respectful to you. It's pretty simple and kids don't have to learn a hundred different rules. They just need to have to learn one rule. It's called the golden rule. And the golden rule is the next verse on your outline where Jesus said in Matthew 7, 12, this is the famous golden rule of Jesus, in everything you do, do to others what you would want them to do to you. This sums up all the law and the prophets. He said the whole Bible is summed up in this. Treat people the way you'd like to be treated. Well, that's not rocket science. A, a, a little child can learn, how do I want to be treated? That's the way I treat others. And if I learn that one rule, treat other people the way I'd like to be treated, then I am going to be respectful. Does that make sense? All right, let's go to the second one. The second R in a remarkable life. If I want to build a remarkable life and a remarkable career, Second thing I'm gonna to have to learn is not just how to show respect, I'm gonna to have to learn to be reliable. Reliable. Because if you're not reliable, nobody's gonna trust you. And if nobody trusts you, you can't do business with them, you can't lead them, you can't have any impact in their life. Now in the Bible, the word reliable is not used that often because it's a fairly modern term. But the concept is all through scripture and it's called being trustworthy. Trustworthy is the same thing as being reliable, being worthy of trust. Another word that the Bible uses for reliable is the word faithful. And the Bible talks about being a faithful friend, being a faithful spouse, being a faithful leader, being faithful to God, being faithful to your church and your family and your friends and on and on. And the Bible says that faithfulness, people who are reliable, that they, you can count on them, it says they're very rare. They're very, they're very remarkable because most people are not reliable. They're not. Now let me give you a definition. Reliability means being dependable, being trustworthy, being honest, being loyal. And the Bible says in Proverbs 20 verse six, there are plenty of people who will tell you, you can trust me. Yeah, all right, run for the border. But it's hard to find someone who is truly trustworthy. A lot of people, in King James it says, every man will proclaim his own faithfulness. But who can find a faithful man? In other words, it's rare. It's remarkable when you find somebody that you can totally trust. And, and, and employees pay big bucks for people who are reliable. They go, I, I can count on them. Now, how do I do that? How, how do I grow reliability? How do I develop a reputation for being a reliable person? Well, there are lots of ways, but let me just give you three from scripture. Right, write these down. Number one, this is kind of obvious, always tell the truth. Duh, if you don't always tell the truth, then um, you're, you're not reliable. If I'm honest 80% of the time, is that reliable? No. It's kind of like if I said to my wife, Kay, honey, I'll be faithful to you 28 days a month. <laughs> really? Partial faithfulness is unfaithfulness. It's either all or nothing. And reliability means I'm always there and I, I always tell the truth. 
The Bible says in Proverbs 17, seven, respected people do not tell lies. Number two, always do what I promise. That shows reliability. It shows it to, to a boss, to an employee, or a supervisor. Always do what I promise to do. The Bible talks about like clouds without rain is a, is a friend who promises to do something and then doesn't do it. Proverbs 28, 13 says this. Reliable friends who do what they say are like cool drinks in a sweltering heat. Refreshing. <laughs> I like that in the message paraphrase. Here's another verse there in your outline. Psalm 15, 4 says this. They keep their promises to their neighbors even when it hurts. Do you do that? Have you ever made a commitment and, you know, there's no problem with that, but then something else comes up that's better? And you go, I want to get out of this commitment because this is a better thing. And I'll have more fun, I'll make more money, or it'll be more, more relaxing or whatever. Well, the Bible says they keep their promises to their neighbors even when it hurts. In other words, when it's to my detriment. I'm now going to lose money on this or whatever. That's reliability. That is so rare that it's remarkable because most people are not that kind of reliable. So I always tell the truth and I always do what I say I'll do. And number three, I always keep confidential information. This was one of the 10 career uh, limiting problems that people have, gossip. Gossip keeps a lot of people from being promoted in life because they can't keep a secret. They just have to share it with somebody else. Uh, reliable people know how to keep their mouths shut. They know how to keep confidential information confidential. Do you? Can, if somebody tells you a secret, can, they, can you be counted on to not tell anybody? That's pretty rare. That's remarkable. Proverbs eleven thirteen: gossips can't keep secrets, but a trustworthy person can. You'll never be remarkable if you can't keep a secret. You'll never be remarkable as a gossip. By the way, when people gossip to you, you can be certain they will gossip about you. You just need to know that. You may not think so. Well, they're my friend. If they're gossiping to you, then they will gossip about you because they get power by spreading information. It, it makes them feel superior. It makes them feel in control. And anybody who has to share bad news about other people and gossip to you is going to gossip about you also. And the Bible tells you over and over and over and over and over, avoid gossips. Don't hang out with them. Don't be friends with them. Stay away from them. Why? Because it's contagious. Proverbs 11, uh, 13 in the New Living Translation says this. A gossip goes around revealing secrets. But those who are trustworthy, in other words, reliable, can keep a confidence. Again, corporations pay big money for people who are not just you know, respectful, but they're reliable. So how do you do that? How do you build reliability, um, these qualities and some of the other things are related to it uh, in yourself and in kids? You know, I think um, reliability um, comes to mind when I'm teaching my children mm -hmm. how to be trustworthy, mm -hmm. how to make the right decisions, but if you do make the wrong decision to own up to it. Mm -hmm. And my sweet daughter allowed me to tell this story. Um, she was in first grade and she had looked at someone else's paper and she felt so guilty. That night she told us about it and uh, we said, well, you're gonna need to tell your teacher about it the next day. And she just walked into first grade and she'd let her teacher know mm -hmm. that she made a mistake. And I think when we teach them to be reliable and trustworthy, when we give them the opportunity to be empowered to do that, rather than me or my husband going in and talking to the teacher, mm -hmm. she really owned it. And then she learned that she needed to do what, the right thing. And it's a process. That's a huge lesson for her to go by herself mm -hmm. and do that. We'll come to that, come back to that, but that's good. 
Well, I always tell my kids, my response is my responsibility and their response is their responsibility. And when I think about this thing with gossip, so many times we have the choice whether we're gonna participate in the gossip or not. So someone else might be saying something and we get to choose, are we gonna respond? Are we gonna participate? Mm -hmm. Or same thing with telling the truth. Are we going to choose to tell the truth or are we gonna sail a lie because we don't wanna get in trouble. Mm -hmm. And so that's I, one of the things I try to teach my kids. My response is my responsibility. You know, in most states, for you to willingly receive stolen goods and you know they're stolen, the penalty is the same as stealing it. That's true of stolen information and gossip. That you say, well, I don't gossip, but you're receiving it. So you're perpetuating the problem in that office. It's not being reliable. And it's not, well, I don't share it, but if you take it, you're, you're receiving stolen property, stolen information, stuff. But what is gossip? It's sharing information when you're neither part of the problem nor the solution. That's gossip. If you're part of the problem, then you need to deal with it. If you're part of the solution, you need to go to that person. So I'm thinking about how much we can learn from non-examples and mm. from the moments where people aren't reliable for us and how we use that pain to fuel being better and being more reliable. So when a child is gossiped about or when we're gossiped about and we remember how much it hurts to hear that, how much that can reinforce our commitment to being better. And um, so for me and for the kids I serve and for everyone else, I think that's, that's probably the biggest piece is, is using those ex non-examples and those moments of hurt to fuel being more reliable. Hmm. Okay, so we're talking about not the three R's of reading, writing, arithmetic. We're talking about the four R's of character that build a remarkable life. And the first one we said is to be respectful and the second is to be reliable. Here's the third one, resourceful. If I want to build a remarkable life, if I want to build a remarkable career, I must learn to be resourceful. Now, I'm gonna explain this to you, but again, as I said, companies pay top dollar, pay a lot of money for people who are resourceful. And who are resourceful people? They're people who figure out solutions to problems, they, they, they are resourceful in that they, they look for ways to do a workaround, a creative solution, uh, they're figuring out ways to solve problems. Here's a definition. Resourcefulness is two things. It's making the most of what I have. Do you know how to do that? Not waiting for something else to come in before you actually start living. Making the most of what I have and finding solutions to problems that others have overlooked. That's what it means to be resourceful. My dad's motto, and I heard him say it over and over growing up, was I will do the best I have, the best I can, with what I have for Jesus Christ today. I like that. I'll do the best I can with what I have for Jesus Christ today. I'm not waiting for everything to fall in place. If I'm waiting for perfect environment, nothing's ever gonna get done. I'll do the best I can with what I have. That's resourcefulness. You need resourcefulness in your finances because you're never gonna have unlimited finances. You need resourcefulness in your time. You're never gonna have unlimited time. You need resourcefulness in, in creative solutions, in relationships, in your health, and in a lot of things because we live, as I said, in a broken, imperfect world. You're never gonna have perfect circumstances for anything. Nothing in your life will ever have perfect circumstances. There will always be something wrong with it. That's why you need to learn to be resourceful, where you do the workarounds with the problems, with the weather, with the lack of this resource or whatever, whatever we need. One of the great examples of resourcefulness would be Paul. And in Philippians 4.12, he says this, the Apostle Paul. He says, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or an empty one, with plenty or with little. He goes, I don't care if I'm up or down, if I'm in poverty or I'm in prosperity, uh, if things are going good, if things are going bad, I, I, I've learned how to live in it. What's he saying? I'm resourceful. And, and people who are resourceful, who don't have to have everything just right, are the people who get ahead in life. They're the people who change 
the world. They're the people who make an impact, who live remarkable lives. Uh, let me go back to my, my panel of moms. You guys are doing great. So talk to me about resourcefulness. How do we teach kids to be resourceful so that they're not dependent upon us? So one of the things that I think about is not always answering their questions, helping them to find solutions. A lot of times um, children um, and even young adults need to learn how to make decisions on their own. Mm. So instead of answering their question or solving their problem, which I did mm -hmm. for a long time with my own kids, I realized they needed to understand their choices and decisions and how to go about making them. Mm. So I began ans asking them questions and asking them how they were gonna solve the problem and what they thought about it. And it really made a difference in how they came up with um, solutions. They'd pray about it. God would just start this creativity in their mind and pretty soon they had a solution that had formed. Mm -hmm. That's great. So in my uh, classroom, I'm a science teacher and we do a lot of engineering labs now. And a lot of them are problem solving labs. And so the students have to work as a team and collaborate and solve um, and problem solve. And so a lot of times they'll get stuck somewhere and it'd be really easy for me to just tell them the right answer, but I want them to have to troubleshoot and problems, learn that skill of problem solving. So I always just say, how are you gonna solve that problem? And maybe, give a little hint, but I usually do not give them the answer. And so they work together as a team. And what I find is after they've solved it without my help, it's empowering. They feel very proud of themselves. They've, they've worked together and they solve the problem. And if I just gave them the answer, I'm kind of robbing them from having that empowerment that they feel when they solve it themselves. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Julia. Oh, sorry. My, my husband had been laid off three times. Mm. The first two times we learned some lessons and some good things. The third time was the charm. My husband had come to me and said, look, we're going to obey God. We're going to surrender. We're going <laughs> to trust him. He's going to provide for us. Uh -huh. um, and really what God was doing is he was showing us that um, my husband needed to change careers. And we're older. And so that was a little bit of a scary thing for us. Mm. But we trusted God. And today he's in a whole new career at 57 years old mm. that was hard but with God he gave us the ability and the resources mm. to move through that season and the connections mm. into something new that he wanted <laughs> wow so this is such a tough thing to do with kids and with adults because when you can see the solution you want to give it to someone but and, and, and I want to be earlier. seen as the authority to my child. <laughs> and, and you don't want them to hurt. And sometimes I think of how I do it, um, even in my office, when someone presents a problem, it's so much quicker sometimes for me to just solve it than it is for me to allow the struggle because that takes so much more time and so much more energy. And sometimes I have to watch my kids hurt or be frustrated or those kinds of things. But that ultimately I'm giving them more by letting them go through that struggle mm. than I would be if I gave them the solution right in that moment. Mm. Wow. You know, I mentioned this uh, uh, in a previous session that anytime you take responsibility for people, you take it away from them. And, and, and so when you make all the decisions for your child or you solve all their problems, you're actually creating dependency, uh, you're robbing them of dignity, you're keeping them from growing up. Stop solving all your kids' problems. <laughs> because and then one day they're gonna get out on their own, they're not gonna have any, let me tell you something, it's more important that they learn how to solve a problem than it is to actually solve the problem. Because the problem won't last. But the skills that you learn in problem solving do. And, and I, I like what Julia said, and, and actually I think Jody said it, and Deanna talked about it too, is that you have to lead them. We're not talking about leaving them on their own, like you go figure it out. But you can lead them with questions. Jesus was the master at this. Jesus taught people by asking them questions. And, and, and when they come to you, your kids come to you with a problem, you go, well, let's talk about that. How do you think you might solve that problem? That's, that's a problem. That's a real problem. I agree with you. I, I think I've seen it before. Maybe I've never seen it before, but that's a problem. Um, let's talk about what, what, might, what might be some options. Let's try to think of, let's play the game of three. Can we think of three different ways we might solve this problem? Or one to 10. And 
Um, you know, I, I remember when I played the game of one to 10 when I started this church. It's like, I didn't have any money. We didn't have a building. So where are we gonna meet? And I just got out a piece of paper and I wrote one to 10. And I thought, okay, where, where could we meet? I thought, I wrote down, I think number one was um, a Jewish synagogue because they don't meet on Sunday. Okay, <laughs> that, that might be open. Uh, I think number two was a Seventh-day Adventist church. Okay. I, I, you know, because they, they don't meet on Sunday. Uh, number three was uh, get a tent. Okay, number three or four was like in a park. Uh, f- number five was like, um, what about uh, uh, Sunday morning at a movie theater? Because nobody goes to movies at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning. And, and I literally just made a list and, and started working that. And I, I think number seven was like get a school and that's where we ended up. Well, you just force yourself to think through. And, and so you can ask questions and don't solve the problems for them. Now, you're not leaving them on their own. You're guiding them. And, and, you say, and when they start to go down the wrong way, well, no, well, that might. Think about this. What might that be the consequence of that? But you're, you're building the muscle by letting them learn problem solving because that's what resourcefulness is. If you solve them problems for all of them, if you treat your kids as babies, you're gonna to have to diaper them the rest of your life. The same goes for employees, okay? And, and, and you know, same goes for church staff. And people would come to me and say, what do you think we should do? I said, what do you think you should do? I said, well, you're the pastor. Yeah, I am. And I'm telling them, what do you think you should do? And you force them, well, you say, well, they might make a mistake. Well, I don't want to make all the mistakes myself. I want to spread the blame around in this church. I want you making some of the error. I don't want to make all the failures. So come on, share the blame. You, you make a how do you, how do you How do you become wise through experience? How do you get experience by making wrong decisions? And then when you make Wrong decisions, you get wisdom, and then that gives you good decisions. Anybody else want to say anything more about that? The only thing I'll add is that one of my favorite things is when current research matches biblical truth, and mm-hmm. exactly what you're saying is, is what's out there right now. Um, there's a book called The Multiplier Effect that talks about employers, and the best way to be a supervisor mm-hmm. is to not give all the answers to your staff and to make them, to multiply talent is to make them solve problems and to make them find things. That's great. This is why when we go on peace trips, we don't do stuff for other people in other countries. We help them do it for themselves. A lot of people come in and go, I wanna go somewhere and build an orphanage. Please don't. First place in a list of 99 things to do for orphans, I'd put it at number 99. Ask any kid in the world, do you wanna be in an institution or in a family? 100% 100% will say in a family. It'd be actually better to pay an aunt who doesn't have the money to take on a couple of extra kids than to put them in an institution. Because when you take a kid, when their mom and dad die, and you take that kid and put them in an orphanage, you're guaranteeing, them, guaranteeing perpetual poverty because they lose all their land rights in most countries. And what we think is helping is actually hurting. We don't build orphanages. We put kids in families. In fact, we've been shutting down all the orphanages in Rwanda and we're now down to three. We had one last year, we shut down, we're down to three. Rwanda will hopefully be the first nation in the world with no orphanages. Okay. Now, you, what we do is, if you, it doesn't say in the Great Commission, go do things for other people. It says, teach them to do the things I've commanded you. So that's training. All right, let's go to the last one, number four. If I want to build a remarkable life, if I want to build a remarkable career, I've gotta learn the fourth R, which is I must learn to be resilient. Resilient. And that means you don't give up when you stumble, when you fall, when you make a mistake, you get up, you dust yourself off, and, and, and you move ahead. You're resilient, you bounce back. You, you don't fall apart when things fall apart. We live in a nation today filled with people who do not know how to be resilient. And when something goes wrong, they just give up. If at first you don't succeed, their motto is not try, try again, it's give up. 
and expect the government to do it for you, whatever. And you don't, in, when you have resilience, you don't label yourself as a victim. Or as Kay says, you choose joy. You have, you have the same problems everybody else does, but you choose to keep going. You choose to keep moving ahead. Here's the definition. Resilience is the ability to bounce back and to recover from a loss or from failure or from stress or from disappointment. This is one of the most important skills. And people who learn to be respectful and reliable and resourceful and resilient, they're never gonna have a problem getting a job because bosses are looking for that kind of quality uh, person. Let me give you a couple verses. Proverbs 24, 16. When good people stumble, even if they fall seven times, they will get back up. Now I'd like for you to circle the phrase good people because notice that even good people stumble. I love this verse. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says uh, in King James, though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. Even righteous people mess up. Even righteous people stumble. Even righteous people make bad decisions and mistakes. But you don't, failure is never final. Failure is never fatal. Failure is how you learn what doesn't work. So you don't ever call it a failure. Call it an experiment. Because that's how you learn what doesn't work. You know, Thomas Edison, Thomas Edison I think, tried... I don't know, 800 plus different metals before he came up with tungsten as the effective metal for the incandescent light bulb. He didn't say, well, I've failed 800 times. He said, I know 800 things that don't work. <laughs> and, and, and so if you have that learning mentality, we're gonna talk about this in the next series, a learning mentality. Um, it's not like I failed 800 times. It's like I had to get, I had to just try before I found out what, what works. One of the keys of Saddleback Church is that we're not afraid to fail. I just teach our lay leaders, our volunteers, our staff, and they just fail fast. I tell all the staff, I want you failing every week. If you're not failing, you're not trying anything new. It's not a failure to try something out and it doesn't work. We just, well, now we know that doesn't work. What, what, what is bad is if you keep failing, doing the same thing over and over and over and not learning from it. Make it a new failure. Make it a doozy. So as your pastor, I'm telling you, go out and fail this week. It, it won't hurt. It's how you learn to be a success. I, someday I'll write a book, A Thousand Ways to Not Grow a Church. Because I know every one of them. We've tried them all. We try 99 things, they don't work, and number 100 works, then we go out and teach a seminar to 3,000 pastors, pretend like we know what we're doing. But we're not that smart, it's just trial and error. Studies have shown that parents who try to protect their kids from failure and try to buffer them, and, even, and won't, if they do fail, they won't let them feel it. It's okay to let your kids feel bad because they'll re learn that it doesn't kill you. The, the, the people who fear failure the most are those who were not allowed to fail growing up. They were not allowed to fail. And, and, and when they did fail, we immediately switched the subject. We didn't let them feel it. It's, it's part of growing up. It's part of, 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 of feeling bad. It's part of life. One, the sooner you teach your kids law number one, everything on earth is broken, the better. Law number two, nothing is perfect on this planet except the word of God. It's perfect. And God's love for you is perfect. But everything else is broken. It's all flawed because of sin. And so we shouldn't expect it to be perfect. And if we give our kids the idea that life's gonna be a combination of my little pony and uh, you know, rainbow bright with pastels and flowers coming down and, and, and unicorns, they're gonna be pretty upset when they hit the real world. Life is tough, everything's broken, nothing's perfect, but God is good. And life can be good, even in a broken world. And marriage can be good, even though we're all broken. And so can everything else. And ultimately, we're gonna go to a place where it's all good, all the time. And that's heaven, but this is not heaven. Here we have 
you know, lymphoma. And here we have abuse. And here we have a lot of war and a lot of other things. But life can be good even in the middle of bad. But it's choice. And the choice is to learn to be resilient. All right? Good example is Paul. Again, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 and 8, or 8 and, 8 and 9. Paul says, we're often pressured from every side. You ever feel like that? Pressured from every side? We're often pressured from every side, but we're never crushed. Sometimes we don't know what to do, but we never despair. Sometimes we're attacked and we're abused, but God never abandons us. And we get knocked down, but we get up again and we keep going. That is resilience. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9. The Phillips translation says, we get knocked down, but we're not knocked out. We get back up again. Team of panel of moms and teachers, how do we help people be more resilient? How do we teach that? Well, I think you can't learn how to be resilient until you've gone through something hard. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to experience a heartbreak or loss or disappointment, mm -hmm. and then you can learn how to bounce back and be resilient. And four and a half years ago, our family went through a really hard time. We went through a divorce, mm -hmm. and it was really painful, and the kids and I struggled through it. And I learned that the way to be resilient is not to depend on my own strength, because I didn't have enough, but to depend on God's strength. And he would get me through the hard time that I went through. And I taught my kids that as well. And I think we want to protect our kids and shelter them, but we need to show them that they will go through loss. Everyone experiences something in their life and help them learn how to walk through it and depend on God through it. And he's able to be faithful and get us through the toughest of times. And so that to me is what showing resilience is. Mm. And I, I can't overstate the value of being authentic and real and what you've just done in front of a ton of people about our own mistakes and our own failures and how not only is that so valuable for your kids because it teaches them how to respond, but it endears the people around you. People are so much more attracted to you when they see that you're flawed too and that you've made a mistake um, than they might be otherwise. So I, I think you, there's opportunities to do it when you go through something tough and there are small opportunities that, that happen all the time because we're human. Um, you know, it, it happened in my house last week when my daughter looked at me and said, that wasn't a respectful way to talk to dad and I had to, you know, there's a moment where you think, oh, I just failed as a mom. Um, but in that moment to be able to honestly look at your child and say, you're right. I did, and here's what I'm gonna do about it. You teach them that this is what it looks like on a daily basis, that, that I, there's an action step beyond this. I take a minute and then I move forward. Mm. I love what you said, because I think we all make mistakes and repairing the rupture is a huge part of owning, owning it and saying to your kids, I messed up, I wasn't respectful, or I didn't, wasn't respectful to speaking with how I talked with whoever you were speaking with and just saying, um, I'm sorry and repairing that rupture. That's a really important part. Mm. I read this card. It was so awesome um, at the store the other day and it said, put on your brave and decide to be amazing. And I thought, you know, that's really good when it comes to resilience. Get, get up after you've tripped and you stumbled and you fall or if there's a mess or something that's been created. But just put on your brave and decide to be amazing. Hmm. Is this a needed quality in our world today? Yeah. Because we give up too soon. We give up too soon. All four of these qualities are qualities of Jesus Christ. And the more you build these qualities into your life, the more you're Christ-like you're going to be. But I love the fact that all three of these women uh, uh, shared um, that we often help people best by sharing our weaknesses, not our strengths. We often think, well, people are gonna learn from your weaknesses. No, they actually learn more from your, I mean, from your strengths. We actually learn more from your weaknesses. I, I could sit up here uh, in this service and I could tell you all the good things that I'm good at and you'd go well goody for you Rick whoop-de-doo whoop-de-doo you're just you painted the moon you know and, and it, it, it doesn't help anybody it doesn't draw us closer it just go the guy's got a problem with his ego uh, 
Okay. On the other hand, if I get up here and I talk to you about, as I have, about how Kay and I struggle with all different kinds of marriage problems over the year. We've been married 42 years. And, and, and so, but we're more in love than ever before. But the problems, it wasn't always easy. It wasn't always easy. In the first couple of years, we were so close to splitting up, except we just didn't, didn't want to admit it. But, but the problem is, is that, you know, when, 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 when Matthew took his life, my son, after a lifelong struggled with mental illness, committed suicide. Well, somebody as visible as Kay and, and me, we decided we're gonna use this to teach people how to grieve correctly. We weren't gonna waste our pain. We're gonna go, if you're gonna go through pain, you might as well use it to help somebody else. You know that pain you've gone through? Don't waste it. If you'll be honest to God about it, honest to yourself, and, and, and honest with other people, God will use it. Your greatest ministry will often come out of your biggest failure or your deepest pain or your worst regret. And the stuff that you don't even want to talk about that you're embarrassed about, somebody out there needs it. Who could help somebody better who struggled with being abused than somebody who went through the pain of abuse? Who can better help somebody who's struggling with prejudice and bigotry and racism than somebody who's felt the sting of prejudice and bigotry and racism? Who could better help somebody who struggled with alcohol or alcoholic parents, as we mentioned here earlier, than somebody who went through that situation? That's what Celebrate Recovery is all about. God does not wanna waste anything in your life. And part of resilience comes from being able to share it with others where you're able to help other people. Now, this one's so important. Starting next weekend, I'm gonna do a whole series on it. And, and, and we're gonna do a series on how to turn your setbacks into comebacks. Everybody loves a comeback story, but we don't realize there is no comeback unless first you have a setback. Setback's part of, part of the story in your life. Setback is what makes you a hero. If you don't have any setbacks, you're never gonna be a hero. You just got it all fed you with a silver spoon. No, the real heroes in life are those who have setback after setback after setback. Some of you have had health setbacks. I'm going through one right now. Some of you had financial setbacks, relational setbacks, mental health setbacks, spiritual setbacks. And that's why you need to be here at this church. That's why you need to bring people who have setbacks here to this church because this, if you've had a setback, we're gonna help you have a comeback at Saddleback. <laughs> okay? All right? Saddleback is the place for comebacks. It's why the S in our name, each of our values, S stands for second chance place of grace. This place was built on helping people have comebacks, have second acts in life. I don't care how messed up your past has been. Next week, we start a new series on how to have the greatest comeback of your life, how to set the stage for the comeback. What's gonna be your next act, your second act, all right? So start praying about who to bring uh, uh, to this service. And the reason we have resiliency is not because we're better than other people, we're not, it's because of what we know. And we're gonna look at all, there's a phrase that's used all through the Bible that says, because we know. And because we know this, and you can do this. Because we know this, we can do this. Because we know that it's all about perspective. I'll end with one verse. Look at this verse on the screen. Galatians, no, Romans uh, 5, verse three. And it says this. We can rejoice even when we run into problems and trials. Yeah. Even in an imperfect, broken world, we can rejoice. Because we know, that's the key, because we know that they're good for us. They help us learn endurance. What's endurance? It's another word for resilience. Endurance, determination, persistence. All of these things are what the person who learns to be resourceful and reliable and respectful and resilient has the world at their feet. 
because they are remarkable. They are rare because everybody has those other things, those 10 self-defeating limitations that keep you from moving forward in your life. Let's bow for prayer. These all come from Jesus Christ. And if you get Christ in your life, then you're gonna get the power you need, but you have to make the choices. Because you can listen to all these things and not do anything about it. You can go home and do nothing, turn on the TV and forget it. But if you say, I really want to be a remarkable person. I want to be different. I want the rest of my life to be different. Well, okay, let's make that choice right now in this moment. Just follow me in this prayer. Say something like this. Dear God, I want to stop blaming other people for my problems. I want to stop making excuses for my, my problems. I want to learn to be responsible and I want to learn to be reliable and I want to speak the truth and do what I say I'll do and learn to keep confidences. I want to learn to be respectful for everybody even when they disrespect me. They can't control my response. I'm in control of that. So God, I, I want to learn to be like Jesus. To respect people and their dignity, even when I disagree with them. To be resourceful. Help me to learn how to solve problems. To not wait for other people to solve them. To not wait for the government or anybody else, but to Use the brain that you gave me. Help me to be not just resourceful and respectful, but to be resilient and reliable. God, you know the things that get me down. You know how many times I've wanted to give up. You know how many times I've wanted to just throw in the towel. I'm asking for your help. Help me to remember because we know that you work all things for good because we know that you will never stop loving us because we know that you use even the bad stuff in good ways in our lives. I wanna be one of those righteous people that when I fall seven times, I get right back up. And I want, starting this week, the rest of my life to be different. I want this to be a turning point. If you've never opened your life to Jesus Christ, say something like this. Jesus, I want to get to know you. I, I don't understand it all, but I want to get to know you. I want to learn to trust you. I want to ask you to fill my life with faith instead of fear and with love instead of insecurity and with purpose and meaning. And I want to know your plan for my life. And I, I want to start this journey by just saying to you, yes, Jesus Christ, I'm in. I want to accept what you did for me on the cross. And I want to start growing. And I want to live a remarkable life. And I humbly ask this in your name. Amen. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online pastor. I want to invite you to take your next step by checking out our online community or help get you connected to a local Saddleback campus. Three things we have to offer you right now. First, learn more about belonging to a church family by taking Class 101. Second, don't live life alone and get into community with others by joining an online small group or a local home group in your area. Third, Join our Facebook group to be more engaged with our online community throughout the week. Take your next step and learn where a local campus is near you by visiting saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.